there are quite many misconceptions about the Second World War floating around out there. Well, time to sink some of those. Don't worry, this will be quick. So let's start off with Blitzkrieg. Blitzkrieg is a word commonly used when it comes to the Second World War, especially the early German victories in Poland and France. Because the later campaign achieved in six weeks what the Imperial German army couldn't do in four years in the previous World War. Yet there was no Blitzkrieg strategy. To quote the author of the Blitzkrieg legend, the 1940 campaign in the West may be considered the Blitzkrieg par excellence. In reality, however, it was not planned as such. Hitler was counting instead on a years long struggle as in the First World War. The so called Blitzkrieg concept, Blitzkrieg Denken, developed only after the campaign in the West. It was not the cause, but the consequence of the victory. Which brings us to the next point, the mechanization of the German army. A lot of people assume that it was a mechanized army well equipped with tanks, assault guns and half-tracks. Well, nope. The problem is most documentaries always run footage in the background, but that footage is usually propaganda footage. In which of course the Germans showed off their best troops, quite understandably. But let's look at some data. Namely the composition of the German army in June 1941, just prior to the invasion of the Soviet Union. Now the number of divisions was as follows, 21 panzer divisions, 13 motorized infantry divisions, 3 motorized brigades and 95 infantry divisions suited for all operations. And another 62 infantry divisions in various lower states of combat effectiveness. Note that mountain cavalry and various other divisions are not included in this setup. Of course, maybe this isn't convincing enough, so let's look at the number of vehicles for Operation Barbarossa. The German army assembled 600,000 motor vehicles and 625,000 horses. Thus they attacked the Soviet Union with more horses than trucks in summer 1941. Now I know what you're thinking. With so much horses the chariots were either heavily undermotorized or a bunch of bronies. Well, your call. Now after the Battle of France and before Operation Barbarossa there were few things in between. So let's look at the Battle of Britain. Some people still claim it was a close call. Well, by 16th September, the day of the last great attack, Germans believed they had driven fighter command down to 177 effective fighters. The true number was 300% higher. 216 Spitfires and 356 Hurricanes. These assumptions shaped the Luftwaffe's turn from attacking the airfields and command, control, communications and intelligence infrastructure to London. An error but less significant than is often claimed. Those early attacks inflicted little damage. Had the Germans continued them, they still would have lost, just less quickly or badly. Now related to the Battle of Britain is of course Operation Sea Lion, the planned invasion of England. Some people think it could have been done in 1940 if the Battle of Britain would have been a success. Well, let's look at some data. The invasion in Normandy D-Day took the US and Commonwealth forces several years to prepare. These forces included two of the leading naval powers of that time which had experience with amphibious landings and had gained a naval and air superiority close to supremacy in the Normandy region. Even if the Germans could have gained air superiority, they wouldn't have been able to achieve naval superiority. In summer 1940, the German Navy had three cruisers and four destroyers operational. In contrast, the British home fleet had five capital ships, one aircraft carrier, 11 cruisers and eight destroyers. There were also another 7 capital ships, 2 carriers, 7 cruisers and 30 destroyers in the Mediterranean fleet. In short, Germany lacked ships, properly tested amphibious craft, experience in amphibious landings and logistical operations to support such a landing. Considering that the British and US, which had plenty of experience in all those areas, went into numerous troubles during D-Day, it is very unlikely that Sea Lion would have any chance of success unless the Royal Navy would just disappear. Next up a bit on the political side, namely the notion that the USA was neutral in regards to the war in Europe. Well, I will just refer to a law here and then quote Franklin D. Reynolds Roosevelt and let you decide. In March 1941, Roosevelt announced an act to promote the defense of the United States. You probably didn't hear that one before, because it's commonly referred as the Land Lease Act. This act allowed to support with equipment of any country whose defense the president deems vital to the defense of the United States. After various incidents between US warships and German U-boats, Roosevelt in September 1941 stated the following. That means very simply, very clearly, that our patrolling vessels and planes will protect all merchant ships, not only American ships, but ships of any flag engaged in commerce in our defensive waters. Note that the defensive waters were not just the US coastline. Back in July 1941, US Marines replaced British occupation forces on Iceland. 
Now politicians usually produce a lot of hot air, so did the German jet fighters the message mid 262. Yet many proclaim it was too late. Well, it wasn't too late and nobody delayed it, by the way. Jet engines were completely new technology. Even regular piston engine aircraft had a development circle of two to three years during World War II. Furthermore, those engines needed materials that were heat resistant. Germany didn't have those in sufficient numbers. Thus, they had to develop special alloys that were rather limited in quality. By any means, the Messerschmitt 262 was actually introduced far too early. There were only 10 experimental units of those, three crashed, three had an old tail wheel. Of the 3000 required flight hours necessary for proper testing, only 10% were flown. The production series planes have elevator and aileron jitter. For a more detailed view, you might want to check out my video on this topic, which also deals with the Messerschmitt 262 combat effectiveness. Now since we are up in the air, let's move on to strategic bombing which some people claim was just ineffective and useless. First, in World War II strategic bombing was to a large degree still in its infancy and barely understood. This is similar to the development of artillery combat in World War I, which went from complete ineptness to developing principles that are used up to this day. Second, thus once crucial understanding was gained and applied properly, the results were quite effective, in terms of reducing the combat effectiveness of Germany considerably. To give you a glimpse on both the ineffectiveness and effectiveness of strategic bombing, let's take a look at the following remark of the German military historian Horst Bog. One of the most decisive allied successes in the bombing campaigns, the crippling of German fuel supply, was achieved with only about 0.6% of the bombs dropped on Europe and about 1.3% of the bombs dropped on Germany. Yet to achieve this decisive goal in the last months of the war, it required years of experience and preparations even in other areas of warfare. So before we are moving down to the muddy areas, let's stay up a bit in the sky and look at the claim that German aces were better, because they had so many more aerial victories than their allied counterparts. Well, if one thinks a little bit about it, it becomes rather obvious why the German aces had so many air kills. This was explained by one of the leading German aces, Günther Rahl himself. Here is the blitz version of it. First off, German aces usually flew until they died, whereas allied aces often returned home after a certain number of sorties. Second, to shoot something down you need an enemy. Well, Germany and Japan had a lot of shortages, except when it came to enemies. There were plenty of those around. Meanwhile, allied fighter pilots often just saw thousands of their own bombers, and when an Axis plane showed up, they were usually heavily outnumbered. Third, since German pilots were better equipped and trained in the early war, the few German pilots that survived until the middle or late war were way more experienced than the average allied pilots and thus still could rack up kills. In short, under the same circumstances, allies aces would have achieved a similar number than the German aces and vice versa. And this doesn't diminish the achievement of any axes nor allied pilots out there. Let's move to the elephant in the room, Operation Barbarossa, the German invasion of the Soviet Union. Many claim it could have been a success if it was not for the delay. Well, no, nope, yet, nine. Barbarossa failed due to many different factors, but probably the underlying assumption that the Red Army and Soviet Union would collapse after a few weeks or months of fighting was the main cause of them all. Although the gains in territory, captured equipment and men were huge, they were not decisive and the German army suffered substantial losses to achieve them. It is important to note that looking at the mere numbers of German losses can be quite misleading. Barbarossa was started with roughly 3 million men, but those were not all frontline troops. A large amount of them were construction troops and other non-combat units. Yet the large amount of the losses of 1941 were crack combat troops, many of which had fought in Poland, France, Norway, Greece and other places. Hence, the losses sustained affected the combat effectiveness far more than the simple loss figure might suggest. If you don't trust me, here's the data from the German High Command itself on the combat readiness of its troops in June 1941, before the attack on the Soviet Union, and here for March 1942. On the left side, there are the divisions, suited for all operations, and on the far right, there are divisions suited for limited defensive operations. As you can see, in summer 1941, the first number was 136, whereas in March 1942, it was 8. In short, the German army was stopped by the Red Army, not the Russian winter. Now since that was pretty cold, let's warm up with a bit hot air again. So back to politics, namely the Axis, because well, it is a common misconception that it was actually some kind of alliance. 
whereas it was mostly a balloon of hot air and best a dysfunctional family with severe communication issues. Or to put it a bit more nicely, there were no concrete agreements about global warms or even functioning mechanisms of coordinating the war effort against the Grand Alliance. Which brings us to the final point, military intelligence. While some people claim that military intelligence is an oxymoron, others state that military intelligence won the Second World War. Well, a leading military intelligence historian published the following in his intelligence article in the Cambridge History of the Second World War from 2015. Intelligence did little to cause Axis defeat, but much to shape how the Allies achieved victory. In other words, when you don't have a hammer, you can't beat them all, even if you know when and where it will show up. Well, I think we are done here. Notice that almost all these points are more elaborately expressed in various of my videos. As always, all written sources are in the description, as are the links to Facebook and Twitter. If you like this video and want to know more, you might want to take a look at this playlist, which includes all videos that cover the discussed points of this video. Or if you're low on time, just check out the major blunders during Operation Barbarossa. Anyway, thank you for watching and see you next time.